Well, I've written a book on sheep and shearing, the evolution of uh, the merino in Australia and the importance of it. Australia did ride on the sheep's back for many, many years. Uh, it's fine to have minerals and and wealth coming in like that. That's a bit like the Arabs with their oil, but eventually that's going to run out and we've got to stand on our own two feet with our culture. Uh, but we we produce the finest and best wool in the world and, and it evolved west of the mountains from 1824 onwards. And uh, my book's about the evolution of the merino. Uh, it wasn't only just the uh, MacArthur and uh, he's credited with a lot of uh, work that he believed in, uh, that he did for fine wool to be produced, but there's a lot of other guys that came along in the next 50 years. The Pepin brothers, for instance, that introduced the Pepin, Pepin blood, Reverend Sam Marsden was very instrumental in the way he set foundations of some of the old studs, Ejelabra being the best known, I suppose, were direct descendants of his sheep uh, that began around Molong and he imported some good rams and, and selectively bred and uh, they were built on for 200 years from that time onwards by other great people too. I've stuck to Australian history virtually and uh, I've had a couple of joke books published. Um, I started off in Yagara Tall Tales uh, from Yagara and I felt that um, there were some great old guys in my time as a, when I was young. I interviewed these old blokes and they were rabbiters um, and I got some great old tales that are full of lies but it doesn't matter. These old fellas told stories that prevented other people from coming in that didn't know the district and, and trying to get their land where they could trap rabbits and make a living from. Uh, the most famous of the stories is the line in Kirby's Hill. Well, Kirby's had a good property at Yagara years ago, over a hundred years ago, but it was little bits of really good land along the waterhole creek and and uh, uh, surrounding that was they fenced it off and and there was huge useless big hills and it was full of kangaroos and and rabbits and that but they came out at night to feed on the good land so these blokes were trapping rabbits and that there and there was an old guy named uh, who's a good old mate of mine a real dry old case George Pound was his name and when he'd start talking to you, he'd say, Lord God, man, how are you? He had this story, uh, it's a bit in depth, so I won't go too far in it, but uh, apparently about 1929, there was a circus coming from Parks to Ugarra and they had an old van behind a Chev 4 truck and it tipped over in, well, it wasn't a flood, but it was a bit of a fresh in the Billabong Creek on the Ugarra Road just from parks there and it became unhooked and and the lion and whatever else was in there's a tiger in another little part of the cage got away and I'm fairly sure they captured it I'm not sure of the exact story of it but George built on this story so and he used to say that there was a lion in Kirby's Hill and and you know he used to terrify people with these wild stories and one frosty morning he, he tells the story that um, he was trapping rabbits and they used to sell to the freezer in the winter. It wasn't any good trying to do that in the summer because the flies would get them in the daytime and they wouldn't keep. But there was a, up to a train load of, of uh, dressed rabbits per week went down to Sydney from Yagara, Forbes and Parks area there. And a train load was a lot of rabbits every week and that went on for years. So they made quite a bit of money out of trapping rabbits and he had about, a good trapper would have about 100 traps a day out and he'd go around them and gut the rabbits and he'd put the two legs like that and he'd hang them over a rail like that. 
So George thought that he had, he'd been around about three or four times and about three or four o'clock in the morning he had a, I guess about a hundred pairs of rabbits and he's getting pretty tired so he thought he'd have a bit of a rest for a while. Now, now just on daybreak he thought he'd go around the traps one more time and get the rabbits and and uh, gut them and then take a load off to the parks, uh, chilling works there. So he just got outside of his, his tent where he was camped for the night and he heard this dreadful roar and, and, the, and the trees shook and the birds all took off and, and uh, he used to say from that day to this there's never been any birds in that area again and, and uh, he was terrified and he just froze and then he looked down at the ground and he could see these big footprints in the, in the ice of the morning there and he felt that, hey oh, crikey, he said, I'm getting out of here. And then the, the lion roared again there and, and all the kangaroos and everything, they just left the hill forever, never to be seen again. And uh, he was terrified and he had another old mate, George Archer, and they used to call them the two Georges and they're both dry old blokes and good old fellows and had these wild stories they used to tell other strangers that came looking for somewhere to trap. Anyhow, they used to tell him the story about the lion in Kirby's Hill. And the other George said, oh, I heard the same roar, he said, but it wasn't a lion, it was a panther, a big black panther, and I saw him. And just as the sun was coming up early in the morning there, and I had about a hundred pair, just like you, hanging on the, on the sticks there, ready to take in the freezer today. And, um, and he said, I had about one and a half pair left, the lion, and, and, and in George Pound's case, he reckoned the lion ate all his, all his rabbits that he'd worked so hard to get the night before, and another fellow reckoned it was a panther. And while they were arguing about whether it was a lion or a panther, the, he, the great roar came out again, and more birds left the district and never been back again, just left the hill completely. And from that day to this, they took off and left their traps, and and no one's been back there, and and the traps are still there, and and um, you know they used to tell that with a straight face, and these strange blokes used to believe them, and had other stories, of course, too. But um, that was part of the trapping, and and that was part of what I felt was as interesting and as important to pick up these stories from old guys that were there when it was occurring. So I, when I was in the Lions Club, I wrote a, a story that was called Tall Tales from Megara. And as a year I picked up a lot of tall stories and I even guilty of making some up. And, and there's a lot of little bits of truth in some and and uh, no truth at all in others and a bit of a mixture but they're good stories that should be kept as accurately as the old fellas told them I think.